What's up guys, this is Heiss. And this is Leighton. Joined by the ESND train crew, and he's actually repping company, kiss, company product here. Kiss your ass goodbye, ladies and gentlemen. Indeed. And we're coming at you from the Great Western Steam Up. We're on the way in here. There's a chicken. There's a chicken over there. It's kind of strange that we're just like walking down the street and then there's just lots of smoke and steamy things going on over there. And there's lots of people, so should be a lot of fun. 10 yeah. steam locomotives. 10, yeah. All hot. And then a bunch more on display. A bunch from out of state. A bunch of stuff traveled. Yeah. I'm gonna well, see how many people I can convince to stick cameras on their locomotives. Be a lot of good people watching this weekend as well. Indeed. Quality people watching. Foamers, man. Yeah. They also, found the firing valve. <laughs> yeah. Also, look at this lovely shared use path. Amazing being able to walk to a museum. Right? How fun is that? Yeah. Yeah. Well, we're going to go get in there and get tickets and uh, see what's going on. And we'll check in with you later. Leighton, do you see that? Last time you saw that, you hurt it. <laughs> and the time before that. And the time before that. I so, if the SP-18 explodes, it's his fault. I solemnly promise to have nothing to do with any defaults, kabooms, or problems that may happen. Well, he's under oath now, gents. We'll see what happens. Sounds good. It does sound good. It's got new, uh, it's got new piston rings. I <laughs> hope Hey, ain't that neat? <laughs> Isn't that fun? I didn't realize they had a grade here. Yeah, and apparently it is. It's like a percent or something. I think uh, it's enough for you. It, it sounds like something. We get we get to hear a choo choo go go toot toot and chuff chuff. Yes, yes. Yeah. Beautiful sounds. The only five chime we're gonna hear all weekend. Damn straight. There's something wrong with him. A lot. Thank you very much for noticing. That is a pile of steam engines. It's a pile of wood. And a pile of, oh my god, there's a lot of firewood. But there's at least three wood burning engines? Uh, so I think four? Four? Yeah, it's gonna be cool. Leighton's just had a realization. That's the most powerful engine on the property, we think. Yeah, I it's it's got like what 19,000 pounds of tractive effort or something stupid. Like yeah. That. Small but mighty. Yeah, the chicken is massive. Big, big 040. Yeah. It's a contest between the 18 and the and the two. Who's got the power? That's uh, that's hilarious. That's old boilers for you though. So the Great Western Steam Up was a really awesome event that happened over the July 4th weekend at the Nevada State Railroad Museum. The event featured nine different operating steam locomotives, which is the most I've ever seen in one place at a time. It even outdid the Victorian Iron Horse Roundup at the Cumbres and Soltec last year. And it was just kind of amazing to be surrounded by that much machinery, particularly of a steam-operated nature. Beyond that, there was actually a bunch more steam engines there as well. There was a steam-powered fire engine, there was a couple stationary engines, and a steam donkey. It was just ridiculous. So I went to the event with my buddy Leighton, and he's been on the channel before on a bunch of different videos, some of the Jeopardy and Railroad Tycoon stuff. He's a longtime good friend of mine. He's actually the guy who got me into volunteering at the Colorado Railroad Museum, and we all kind of know how that's turned out. <laughs> So it was fun to go to another museum with him and get to kind of just foam around and see all the different stuff and we had cameras rolling most of the time so I'll have you join us along as we go look at all these different cool things at the Nevada State Railroad Museum. That is beautiful. What is that nickel or is it chrome? Nickel baby. They didn't start chrome plating stuff. That's a 20th century thing I think. That's cool. Indeed. Well, that's cool. Wait a minute. Are they doing steam-powered snow cones over there? I think they are. Well, we know where you're going. Oh, 
It's Joe Douglas. And not Betsy because it has a tender. But pretty dang close to being Betsy. Pretty dang close. Is it? It looks like it's an 8 ton. I don't know. It might be. The cab's a little big. It might be an 11 ton. Might not be the original cab. True. <laughs> With objectively too much whistle. <laughs> Holy shit. Whoa, look at that casting there. That's gorgeous. Beautiful Pacific casting. Scott, this is the one that was built in Sacramento. Wow. Um, you've heard of a builder's plate. Is that like a builder's crest? That's pretty cool. I've never seen anything like that before. Also, like 1873. Like four years after they finished the Transcontinental Railroad. This was hot stuff. It. How about that? And I can't tell if that's a mannequin or somebody taking a nap. I think it's a mannequin. I hope. There's a hole in, hole in the boot. Either that, they're There's dead. There's a snake in my boot. Is this the real McCoy? Actually, that might actually... Might actually be a real I McCoy? I think that's a McCoy. Probably is, actually, yeah. Like the first one I've ever seen. Me too. My understanding is McCoy's went in a fashion before the turn of the century. That sounds about right. And it's also got a hydrostatic feed that's fun. Yeah, what is this? Leighton just pointed the switch out. Narrow gauge can only go the one way, but the standard gauge is a stub switch. Yeah, uh, turn around and show them the, the four rail for the turntable for context. Four rail from the turntable. And then you have to throw the narrow gauge rail to get the standard gauge rail out of the way because the clearance isn't there. That is... <laughs> That is wacky. <laughs> also, notice ye olden switch stand because this isn't like a normal harp stand or a normal in Colorado. Oh god, it's, the got the, it's got a it's flip, got the up. flip up. That's neat. Yeah. I've never seen one like that before. Yeah. This is like, I literally have only ever seen one of these in the great locomotive chase movie. Like that <laughs> angry old guy in Georgia with the pipe is like, I'm gonna get right for that's, that's awesome. That is just absolutely gorgeous. <laughs> so the coolest thing on this, this was matched, all color matched in the original ball of paint. On the sample, right there on the cab bracket. Oh my God. That's original 1875 ball of paint. That's cool. That's stuff that you don't think exists anymore. Yeah. If you go to the Rare Museum of Pennsylvania and get to look at the Tahoe, the BNT mobile that's there, on the side that the public can't see, they've started peeling paint away on the drivers and on the cab bracket like that. There's a lot of 1870s ballpoint paint on that. Too. That's, that's, cool. yeah. that's incredible. Yeah. As the chicken slips behind us, yeah. just because there's too many things going on today. Also, we have a, a hypothesis. Is the chicken, in fact, the most powerful engine here? It has the most tractive effort of anything here. That is hilarious. It. <laughs> <laughs> Come on, sweetheart. God, he's got her hooked up high. Well, it runs on center, so. Well, yeah. Stoffy. Yeah. Two guys can push that thing. It's insane. Are you kidding uh, I'm me? I'm not kidding you. It rolled so easy. And it slips so easy, Come too. On. So one thing that really impressed me about the event and the Nevada State Railroad Museum itself is that the museum is really open concept. There's not a whole lot of fences, there's not a whole lot of channelization, you can kind of roam wherever you want, and given that and the amount of people and stuff going on, the commitment to safety and really coordinating moves and making sure people were protecting any time a train was moving anywhere was like outstanding. It's totally different from the way that the Colorado Railroad Museum operates, 
we have our railroad all fenced off. We have chains up around the turntable, try and keep people kind of cordoned off and, you know, mechanically separated. So it was really cool to see this open concept where you could just walk up to any piece of equipment that was out there and go for all sorts of cool different camera angles and camera shots. But at the same time, the museum knew that and was ready and prepared for it. There were two guys on either side of the locomotive making sure that people were away from the tracks when something was moving off of the turntable. There was always good safety and coordination of what was going on. And I was genuinely impressed with how good of a job they did. So kudos to the Nevada State Railroad Museum for really taking care of the safety piece. I also thought the setup of the museum itself was pretty cool. They also have a circle of track like we have at the Colorado Railroad Museum, but they also have this long Y tail kind of built into it so that they can pull trains off and load separately and then bring them out onto the loop, which led to a really cool operational scheme where we had a narrow gauge train and a standard gauge train and they would kind of alternate and one would wait for the other to pull out of the station, it would get on the loop and then we'd pull behind him pull back into the station, go load, and then they just kind of switch as they did laps, which was really cool and really helpful when they had so many different operating locomotives going out throughout the day. So they always were able to have something running while they were changing a locomotive or loading people or whatever. It was kind of a neat setup. They would basically alternate standard gauge train, narrow gauge train, and then they'd swap the engines out different days and different times of the day. So you got to really see almost everything pulling cars, which was pretty cool. So I was able to get footage of all nine of the locomotives in operation. Some of them I only got a little bit because they didn't run that much or they didn't run that much the times when I was there. So I want to show each one of those locomotives and give a little bit of the history so that we can all appreciate the fact that they were all at this one location at the same time. So the first locomotive that we'll take a look at is the Glenbrook. And the Glenbrook is a 260 mogul built by the Baldwin Locomotive Works in 1875. It's from that era of locomotive where so much care and love went into building these and they were really craftsman art as well as a utilitarian locomotive. I mean, you look at all the brass, the scroll work, the lettering, just everything on the locomotive is just amazing and faithfully restored to that appearance, which is just kind of incredible and something that you don't really get to see that often, which was awesome. Glenbrook was originally built for the Carson and Tahoe Lumber and Fluming Company, which is a three-foot narrow-gauge railroad that ran in Nevada and California, right around Lake Tahoe, right where the museum is. Those injectors, man. They're so cute. <laughs> and the, the copper steam and delivery line. And then the, the suction line that is beautifully hooped over the fender. That's it has fenders. The, the, the it has they, a... they put so much love and care into fabricating these back in the day. It's just... Are those cosmetic add-ons? <laughs> yeah. The DLC coming soon. The DLC coming fenders. The modern Glenbrook. Uh, actually, it's, the, it's almost well, it's modernized. Actually, it's it has the Glenbrook spoiler on it. So does it, does it, it has really? The spoiler yeah. that was built for Glenbrook. For Glenbrook, yeah. But then it was like in the modern configuration. That's how that works. Yeah. yeah. The boilers were. I got a new boiler when I got converted to oil, and that's why they were able to use it on that that one because they're sisters. Huh. I didn't know that detail. And one as built, built, one end of career. Yeah. That's neat. So if you wanted to know what the Glenbrook would look like, what if I forgot it? What was also really neat to see is that Glenbrook's sister, the Tahoe, was also at the event. The Tahoe is now known as the Nevada County Narrow Gauge Number no. 5. It is 
a total sister locomotive to the Glenbrook. They were built in the same order, I believe. It was like, I think their builders' numbers are even like within three or four or something, which is kind of neat and odd at the same time. Um, and the Nevada County Nergich number five was just put in service like a month before the event. It's kind of amazing that they were able to get it completed and actually able to run right before the event, and it was really cool to see as well. The number five is what the Glenbrook would look like as a modern engine. Both the engines got modernized throughout their working lives and would have looked pretty similar to the way the number five looks now, it's just that the Glenbrook has since been backdated and restored to its as-built appearance. The number five getting finished like just before the event meant that the engines not really had a chance to work in or break in really at all, so they didn't have any cars behind it, but they did do some flying loops around when the Inyo was doing its special trains as well, so they had two trains on the loop at a time, which was kind of cool to see the, the difference between a little 260 and a big woomfing 440. So really cool to see the, the Glenbrook and then kind of what the Glenbrook looked like later in its life, both at the same event, both under steam, and as Leighton said, apparently both with the Glenbrook spoiler. Kind of fun. Now the Inyo was a bit of a treat for me to see. I have never seen a big standard gauge 440 like that, of that vintage, of that era actually operating. And it's just like, you watch any of the cowboy movies, the old Hollywood, you know, Buster Keaton stuff, and it's like, that's what you see. Big honkin' 440 with all of the fancy paint, the brass, the everything, and it just feels like something out of a movie. It doesn't feel like something that you can see in real life, but there's the Inyo, and it's doing the thing. So, again, standard gauge 440 built for the Virginia and Truckee Railroad in 1875 as well, but just to hammer home how obsolete those designs became and how early they did, this thing was retired in the 1920s. The Inyo was retired from daily service before 491 was built. It's pretty crazy to think that this thing had like a 50 year service life, but the whole time steam had been on the up and up with more technology and more power. I think one of my favorite things about the Inyo is that because it's got such big cylinders, it has a really similar exhaust beat to 491, but it's really kind of soft because it's only pulling one car and up a up a slight grade at the Railroad Museum. So it kind of just has this kind of nice big woomph, 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 woomph kind of feel to it. And it's just, I don't know, it was just kind of neat. I enjoyed it. The passenger coach that the Inyo was pulling was an absolutely gorgeous passenger car. I believe it was also in from California. And it was bizarre because it still had the Miller Hook couplers, which are like sketchy, weird, early attempt at, at some other kind of coupler other than Lincoln Pin. And uh, I'm gonna have to do some research because Leighton and I sat there and stared at it and went, we've only read about these in books and we don't know how they work. And I think they were bypassing it with Lincoln Pin anyways to actually operate it. Is the mirror image of this and keeping it in tension? I don't know. M mucho scary, oh. Miller hook? Also, kiss your ass goodbye and have a beer. Indeed. Indeed. Cheers. I like it when you can have beer in the shop. It's not it's not often. No. Oh, one thing that I had to to laugh at was they had this whistle on display from the Southern Pacific Railroad and as I say, looks like one of the ESD ones. <laughs> Speaking of the Southern Pacific, the next engine that we got to see at the event was the Southern Pacific 18. 
and its Southern Pacific narrow gauge, number 18. The Southern Pacific Railroad, well known for the daylight and the, these big passenger trains that they had throughout the years, had a decent amount of narrow gauge equipment too that also ran throughout California. The 18 is the only example of an operating Southern Pacific narrow gauge steam engine and it's, it's really kind of neat and kind of weird to see. The whaleback tender really always throws me off as something that is just kind of an uncommon design. So you get to see it and it's like, well, that, that's kind of cool. The 18 is a Baldwin built in 1911, originally for the Nevada, California, Oregon Railroad, later acquired by the Southern Pacific. And the 18 is known as the Slim Princess, which is kind of a fun nickname. It's a wonderful locomotive. I got to ride behind it on the Durango and Silverton back in 2019, I think. And just a just an awesome little ten wheeler. It's actually pretty similar in size and tractive effort to the twenty. It kind of feels like something I know, but it's kind of funny too. You get up in the cab, and it's not a deckless engine, but it's an oil burner. So it's like, well, twenty is deckless, but coal burner. Why can't we have it the other way around? <laughs> Next is the Chiggin. The Chiggin is a gigantic Porter 040. It's got to be one of the bigger 040s that Porter ever made. I mean, you hear that it's an 040, you see pictures and videos of it, and you're like, okay, it's a, you know, it's a little tank engine. You see it in person and it's like, this is just a brick outhouse of a steam locomotive in a very dense, big, beefy package. Like, I don't know, it's just a really cool locomotive. And so it's called the Chiggin because it lived most of its life being painted in gaudy, awful paint outside of a fried chicken restaurant. So when Staffy bought it, he just kind of took that and ran with it. So it goes everywhere and it's got a little rubber chicken stuffed in the front coupler knuckle, which is fun. Staffy overhauled the engine at the Mount Rainier Scenic Railroad um, in the early 2010s, I want to say and then it's bounced around Washington for a little bit, and now it resides in California, but it was great to see it at the event. And uh, yeah, 040, but it's got the most power out of anything at the event. The thing is an impressive beast of a little switching engine. It's just really, really cool. And huge thank you to Staffy as well. Staffy actually let me toss a couple cameras on the engine, so we got to have an official chicken cam looking off the front pilot. And one of my favorite shots from the whole event was putting it on the waste sheet underneath the boiler, staring back at the Stevenson valve gear and at the burner. So you can actually watch the oil fire through the air inlet right where the burner is, and you can see what the fire does as the engine works. And I had no idea how that shot would turn out, and it turned out really well. So cheers to Staffy for letting me do that. And here we see the Jason J. Hill in his natural habitat making sure he crosses 25 feet in front of the locomotive and doesn't hear me. Are we going to have like a BBC nature documentary overview of this of just B-roll? Here we see the FOMAs in their natural habitat.
next is the Virginia and Truckee number 25, a standard gauge 10 wheeler. This thing was pretty cool to see. It was a little bit more modern than some of the other engines from the Nevada State Railroad Museum. Big oil burning 10 wheeler, pretty decent sized driver, so it's pretty cool to see. But one of the highlights of the weekend was when the 25 went out with the Chiggin together and they did a double header on July 4th itself. And I'm not 100% certain as to the reasoning why, but the, the first set, they had the Chiggin do all the work, and then the second set, they had the 25 do all the work. So we got to hear some really good stack talk as the engines worked up great. Because when you add a locomotive as dead weight, well, you got a lot more weight to pull up the hill. So unfortunately, we were on the way out and I'd packed everything up because we had to go get to the airport when the 25 was running around doing the lead. But we got to hear the chicken really get after it on the hill and seeing two engines roll by, always a good time. While the Chiggin is a giant Porter 040, this thing isn't. <laughs> Here we have the other end of the spectrum as far as Porter 040s. I think this is an 8 ton little Class B Porter just like we have in Railroads Online. And it's just as cute as you'd think it is in person. <laughs> it was really cool to see this little thing go, and uh, it was cool to see its cute little tender, which apparently was made out of a uh, rotary dump car frame or something. Totally home-built, neat little thing. And uh, it was great to watch it run back and forth. Cool little engine with way too much whistle, but you know, it's, well, it's just fun. <laughs> And speaking of engines from railroads online, next we have the Eureka and Palisade number four, the Eureka. And this is a 440 built in 1875. Another ancient piece of work. And again, three foot narrow gauge. This engine and the Glenbrook both, they're just absolutely gorgeous locomotives. Seeing them in the current condition they are restored back to the appearance from the 1870s is just a treat.
but certainly not least, is the Bluestone Mining and Smelting Number 1, a standard gauge Heisler. And I know I toss a lot of shade at the geared engines and logging engines in a lot of the videos that I do for their mechanical reliability and everything, but this thing was awesome to see in person. They are mechanical marvels, and yes, the maintenance can be a headache with all the different bits and bobs, but getting to see it move and actually do the thing up close was really, really cool. I'd never gotten to see a Heisler run before. This is actually the first geared engine I actually got to see run in person, and just watching all of that madness happen was just really kind of cool. This Heisler came in from the California-based Roots of Motive Power Museum that also brought stationary engines and stuff like that. And a really, really cool locomotive and wonderful crew on it as well. They also let me throw a couple cameras on the locomotive for what turned out to be some of my favorite shots from the event. When you watch a Heisler run by, it's one thing, but when you can actually sit there and watch the engine run from inside the frame is really, really cool. And it looks like a lot of stuff going on, it looks pretty complex, but when you break it down it's actually pretty simple and maybe we'll take a, a deeper dive look into that in another video sometime because I got plenty of footage to sift through from that. But what a cool set of shots, it was just really really cool and I can't believe how well they turned out. So overall it was an absolutely fantastic event, a great gathering of all these locomotives and all these different people from across the steam industry all in one place. It was really, really cool to see everything operate and, and see it operate all safely and wonderfully. Huge props to the Nevada State Railroad Museum for putting this event on and doing it in, in the professional way that they did. It turned out really, really well and I had a heck of a lot of fun. Uh, Leighton was keeping track of all the people that uh, came up and recognized me and it was kind of touching and wonderful to get to meet so many of you viewers at this event. The total count at the end of the weekend I think was something like 32 or 33 people had come up and said hey hi and it was just I don't know. I wasn't something I was expecting and it was just really touching and wonderful to get to meet you guys and hear your stories about how you guys got involved with trains or volunteering at museums or whatever and it was a lot of fun. And uh, one of my favorite things from the whole event, it still makes me giggle, is I got a message on Discord from a user in my Discord 
before the event, and he said, hey, you're going to have to meet up with me to pick these up. And, uh, <laughs> he put together, he put together, like, 50 or 60 ES&D branded P-Cups. So, yeah. I gave out a bunch of them, but I still have a lot of them at home, so we're gonna have to figure out something to do with these. Maybe a giveaway or contest or Rail Valley contest or something, I don't know. We'll have to have some fun with it, but yeah. <laughs> what, a, what, a, what a silly fun thing. And I, I was just genuinely touched that someone would put these silly little things together. It's a silly joke on the channel, but I don't know. It was not something I was expecting, and I, I don't know. It was just great. So the whole event was just kind of this wonderful networking thing to meet all these different people from all these different railroads, get to hang out, tell train stories, and all that stuff. I mean, it was just... It was really cool and something that I'm never gonna forget for the rest of my life. It was really, really cool and who knows if we'll ever see that many steam engines in one place again. Who knows? So I hope you guys enjoyed the video about the event. I know I had fun putting it together and fun going and filming everything. So thanks so much for watching everyone. I really appreciate it. Make sure you click the like button. If you're new here, click the subscribe button. It's also the little bell that you can click if you want to get notifications for when I'm posting stuff or going live. And then of course, thank you so much to the ESD train crew. The ESD train crew are the people who help support the channel monetarily, either as brakemen or conductors and they get a couple extra perks from me for helping out and I really genuinely do appreciate it but uh, they get some cool emojis they get to see the thumbnails for the videos before they come out get a little bit of extra content too like the ESD conductors got to see that shot from the Heisler almost right after the event and uh, everyone else had to wait a little bit but of course we do bring it out and show it off to everyone so you don't have to join the train crew if you don't want to they just get a couple little extra perks and they really really help me out in return so I really appreciate that anyways thank you so much for watching everyone we'll catch you next time